Hi, this is Laura Judah with Champion Builders Center. I want to welcome you to this transition season between Passover and Pentecost and I invite you to go on a little journey with me through the wilderness and see what we might learn from the Hebrews and their journey. Uh, we are in a transition month of ER, uh, the, the Hebrew month of ER on God's calendar. And the tribe associated with this month is the tribe of Issachar. And what they were known for was knowing the times and seasons. And so this is um, part of, of us getting educated on understanding the times and seasons that we're walking through. Uh, it's significant, it's important to God, and it's there for us to benefit from so that we can understand what God is doing and what he's speaking to us in different seasons and we stay in time with him. This is how we're going to really be able to advance quickly and overcome the obstacles that the enemy tries to throw in our path because God is always wanting to give us a heads up on what's coming. So today, uh, May 13th, it's the 24th day of counting the Omer, which is another little piece of the transition here between Passover and Pentecost. Uh, just a quick background on that. Passover was the first harvest for the uh, Israelites, the barley harvest, and Pentecost was their second harvest, the wheat harvest. And so they counted the Omer, which really is a unit of measurement um, and it's it was a counting that brought them into a place of anticipation. They were looking forward to the wheat harvest. And the Omer was the unit of measure that said this was their daily portion of manna as they went through the desert, um, looking forward to when they would receive the fullness of their harvest at Pentecost time. So we are on the 24th day of counting the Omer right now. We're like halfway through the period towards Pentecost. And today we're going to look at the first stop that the Israelites made as they came out of Egypt and they were moving towards Mount Sinai. Um, they went a three days journey into the desert. They had just seen God deliver them through the Red Sea and they came to Mara. They were thirsty. They were, they were tired and they were looking for water and they ran up to the water expecting to be able to drink it and found out that it was bitter. It was poisonous and they weren't able to drink it. And instead of remembering the miracles that they had just witnessed and being thankful that they were delivered and, and realizing if God delivered us through that, certainly he can deal with the waters that we have need of right now, they resorted to what was natural to them, grumbling and complaining. They were angry. They had bitterness in their hearts. And my guess is that these people were bitter because they had suffered a lot of trauma under slavery in Egypt for so many years. They were there for 400 years and they were literally beaten. They were emotionally beaten down and um, they had been under the cruelty of the taskmasters of Egypt. So they knew about God. That information had been passed down to them through their forefathers but being in Egypt all that time, they also got to know the gods of Egypt and they brought them into their worship as well. Um, I wonder if it was their experience that God that they had heard about just really hadn't lived up to what they were experiencing in their daily lives and possibly were they disillusioned and feeling hopeless that that God was going to be able to do anything for them. Well, then God did come through and he physically delivered them from slavery, but their hearts were still in a bitter condition. Even though they had seen God do these miraculous things and bring the plagues upon the gods of Egypt, that didn't heal their own hearts. And it left them susceptible to sickness and disease because sickness and disease come when our hearts are broken and bitter. And that's what the Egyptians had experienced. So God used this stop at Mara to test them. He let them see the condition of their own hearts, and then he provided a solution, and that was a tree branch. He instructed Moses to cast the tree into the water, and 
then the waters would become sweet. The tree was a symbol of the cross, and that was God's solution to their bitterness. It was a picture of salvation. Galatians 3.13 tells us that cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And that was Jesus. He hung on the tree and he bore on him his own body the curses that mankind deserved. And instead, he, re he redeemed us from those curses and he gave us the sweetness of salvation. Along with the sign of the tree branch, which they wouldn't have understood at that time, he also gave them a promise, and he said in Exodus fifteen twenty six, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I have put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. So in this statement, he's telling them, I'm not like those gods of Egypt that you thought could heal you. I am your healer. If you listen to me, you won't experience that sickness and disease that the Egyptians suffered. I will heal the bitterness in your heart. I will take away the pain of your past, and you will no longer suffer infirmity. Now, it's so easy for us to read these stories in the Bible, but not really consider how they might parallel our own experience. But the truth is that we've been slaves to a world system as well. We've had our own Egypt to deal with. We think that we're free people, but according to God's design for us, we are not free. We've been confined and conformed to the world. We've been told many things that aren't true, and we've believed the enemy's lies, not because we're bad people, but because we've just accepted what was presented to us as truth. But the enemy has built strongholds all over the earth to control people. And he's crafty. Scripture tells us that he's the prince of the power of the air. He controls the atmosphere here on the earth. And he's planted his evil schemes into each of the seven mountains of society and sought to control everything while trying to make us believe that we're advancing and we've got this, these great new technologies and we're free, but really all these things are only serving to enslave us even further. We are now in the kingdom age on God's calendar and God has determined that enough is enough and he is going to deliver us out of a world system and he's going to raise us up to be who we were created to be. He's heard the cries of his people in our bondage, and he's raising his mighty hand to crush the enemy's kingdoms and to bring them under his authority. Now, of course, this will only be complete when Jesus comes again to the earth, but we are beginning now to the process of taking back the ground that the enemy has stolen and reclaiming it for God. And we are his agents on the earth. So if we're going to do that kind of work, we've got to be set free. Consider for a moment the bondage to alcohol and drugs. Consider the debt and the financial slavery that we're under. Consider how disease and infirmity ravage our bodies and the additional harm that comes to us because of the medications and the treatments that we receive to try to resolve one problem. Consider our history and how it's be re being rewritten by our education experts and the dumbing down of our youth that has occurred over the years. Consider the immorality and the per perversion that has taken over our media and entertainment and how social media and the internet has replaced uh, healthy outdoor activity and socializing among our youth how the breakdown of the family and abortion and gender identity has, has completely broken down our family structures. We're caught in a world that we can barely recognize anymore. And our young people don't even know there was ever anything different. How can you break out of this web? None of us can do that on our own. We can limit certain things, we can try to avoid certain things, but we can't escape the system. Many of the things that I've just mentioned have taken on their own 
a, their own life in our very midst. And they've become our idols or gods. And while we might not want to think of them in that way, we don't think of them in terms of things that we worship. The truth is that worship is anything that captures our attention and an idol is something that we give greater attention to than the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For some, this might be work or the pursuit of leisure activities or sports or food or even socializing in social media. The list is really long. And if we're honest, we have to admit that even though we may be church-going believers, we have many other gods in our life that get far more attention than we give to studying Jesus and his word in order to know who he really is and therefore know who we really are. We haven't thought that it's really worthy to pursue understanding the knowledge of who God created us to be so that we could fulfill our destiny on the earth. And what's happened to us in this process? We've been hardened by life. Our hearts have been broken, calloused, and bruised. Our bodies are in the same condition. Our minds have been worn down. We don't have energy to, to pursue or even fight against the system. And the truth is life has become less joy and more hardship than ever before, especially lately in these last 10 years. So the good news for us today, before I make myself start crying, is that God is our healer too. On our journey between Passover and Pentecost, we should be asking to see the true condition of our hearts and then rejoicing that Jesus has a sweet salvation for us through his death on the cross as well. Salvation includes the healing of our spirit and our bodies and our minds. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still the Lord that heals us. He is still the God who takes the bitterness of the past and makes it sweet as we enter into greater and greater levels of knowing him and who he's made us to be. We're on an exciting journey that can lead us to true freedom. We may not even understand what true freedom is today, but if you stick with this journey, you'll find out and you'll discover who you really were created to be. So stick with me on this journey. Tomorrow we're going to talk about Elim, the place that they went after Mara. And it's, it's a good place. God has good places for each one of us. And so today I bless you and I encourage you to keep pressing in, pressing on to Pentecost. Bye.